in this episode of the Connor Carrick Podcast. I mean, I just think, you know, trying to, in the room-wise, I just try and bring an energy that uh, is contagious and it brings a lot of energy around the room. And I think uh, that's something that I've always just tried to do is bring a lot of energy into the room, get everyone kind of fired up, get ready to go. And I guess just kind of stepping on the ice, just trying to do things on the ice that, you know, make other people want to do it. Welcome everyone to the Connor Carrick Podcast. I am your host, current New Jersey Devils defenseman, Connor Carrick. Today with my guest, Mitch Marner, we'll be talking about high performance, some of his favorite memories as a Toronto Maple Leaf, some of our favorite teammates as Toronto Maple Leafs, and just how he is so active in the community of Toronto, where his uh, desire to continue to build his brand and, and build his legacy out this way, what it's born from. I really enjoy our conversation today. Thank you to all of our listeners from wherever you are in the world. Let's do this. We're going to we're going to tire pump Mitchie for a bit. Um <laughs> Where's your? I want to start off here because I'm pretty pumped about your. You're very uh, passionate guy. Like you love what you love, whether it's red wine. Uh, I remember Lexi and I were really nervous at our wedding. We wanted to um, have oysters. Like mm-hmm. you know, we wanted it to be like a big party, and and you know, so we we spent a lot of money on alcohol. We spent a lot of money on. Um, music which was awesome mm-hmm. and i remember we were talking with the venue we were going to do uh we wanted oysters you know because we knew some of our friends like yourself and they originally wanted to like do this package by the piece and lexi and i totally panicked because we were like there's no way because if mitchy's coming he'll throw down 50 <laughs> to 100 by himself and our strictly our oyster bill with with uh. 16 will be 650 dollars before we even buy one else a drink so um how's your uh where's your coffee game at right now because a lot of people I, i've shared this before but like my love for coffee uh nikita zaitsev's love for coffee who else paul Ayot. paul Ayot and john, john jeller Gale. the the two um two trainers for the leafs mm-hmm. some of the best guys ever but that they yeah. were uh really who gifted me my introduction into making my own coffee and stuff at home Where's your coffee game at right now? Yeah, it's not bad, but I'm uh, I'm not gonna lie to you. I've been I've been uh, doing a good job getting Steph to make the coffee in the mornings, and well, she that loves delegate, it. Delegate, delegate, so man. She's uh, she's she's the one doing all the uh, the coffee making right now, but she's loving it all. It's it's been a lot of fun. It's now we're getting into the iced coffee. She makes the coffee, then just throws it right into the fridge. <laughs> are, you, <laughs> and then, are you guys? You got to chill the cups first, though, like a beer. That's you a good idea. That? We haven't yeah, done that. Chill the cups and throw some ice in there. That's smart. We got to look. We got a couple ice fridges in here, so we got to. Are you guys doing using that, but... Chemex or you guys got a machine going? What uh, you guys been using? No, I think we got the the Chemex. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm so proud of you, man. It's been it's been good. So nice little, proud nice of little coffee, coffee in the development. Month. Yeah, getting better. Um, I know you're with Red Bull, but like you can't. We love Red Bull, but I'm I'm Team Coffee. I'm sorry. Um, I always I wanted to share this story because I I thought this was great. Where I'll never forget when you first signed with Red Bull, and I'm kind of I want to know like what the coolest part of being a part of their team is, just because I'm mm-hmm. curious. But I remember I was at your place, uh, your condo downtown, and they had sent you like fifty hats. Remember we were screwing around with the yeah. DJ thing you had, and they sent you like fifty hats, and I was like, Mitch, like. These hats are sick. There's no way you're going to wear 50. Like, I, I'm taking one. Like, mm-hmm. I need one. And you're like, no, kind of don't. And I'm like, Mitch, relax. You can't wear 50 hats in yeah. your lifetime. Like, just cut it out. I'm taking one. And you eventually just cut it to me straight. You're like, listen, uh, Red Bull doesn't, like, sell their hats. And, like, really, they're only their athletes <laughs> are supposed to wear it. So, like, you can't take one. So don't. Because you'll screw up yeah. my agreement. Yeah. Yeah, um, no. Th- that's that yeah. is like that's a that is one of the agreements. Like anyone that uh, is with him, or it's so funny. Even like talking to Fnuf when I've talked to him, um, you know, he he even said the same thing about they just send you hats on hats. Like my, I got honestly probably a hundred or up hats of Red Bull, and it's hilarious because when it first happened, I was with my family. My family's brother's like 
man, these hats are sick. I'm like, yeah, they're really nice. <laughs> he's like, uh, he's like, I'm going to take a couple back with me so I can wear them. I'm like, no, you're not. He's like, he's like, what the, what the hell's your deal, man? I'm like, I'm like, Hey, like ask dad, he knows too. And you know, the whole thing is that, so when you're walking into a store, you're walking on down the street in Toronto, you see someone with a hat on you, you know, they're an athlete. And it's actually a funny story. It never happened to me. And this year, right before the season canceled, we were in LA and we were shopping. Um, Rodeo, don't know if you heard of it. Ever heard of it. Yeah. Um, and I was actually shopping and, uh, I was getting myself a new hoodie and someone was in the store. No one, he wasn't wearing the hat, but he came over, he came up to me and goes, Hey, like, um, I see you're an athlete. Like, what do you play? And I was like, Oh, I play hockey. Like, how did you know? He's like, Oh, the hat. And you know, that's kind of the first time it's happened to me, but it was really cool. Like me and this guy just started shooting the shit kind of for five to 10 minutes, but you know, Sick. what he did, what I did, all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, kind of went our separate ways, but it's just a cool little thing. But I think the coolest thing about Red Bull is just how many athletes they have worldwide. Yeah all doing different sports that you, you never really, I guess, really think about watching or doing or, or, or tuning into that, you know, they have athletes that do it and, and um, you know, just really how they take care of their athletes too in, in the sports world and the gyms they produce and stuff like that. It's, it's really cool. I mean, now you, you kind of see it firsthand with the PK there and your team. You yeah, see what he yeah, gets Lindsay. from them. So. Have you seen, have yeah. you seen Lindsay's uh, documentary yet? <laughs> no, I haven't, Lexi but I've heard it's great. Oh man, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, and they're they're both great. I I love playing with PK, but getting to know Lindsay's been really cool. Um, really cool too. You have always been really since you first came in the league, pretty ambitious on, and I think you were one of the front runners really because it's it hasn't really been done in hockey culture where you when you first came in the league, you were ambitious on the brand development side, and I think that. And by ambitious, I just mean by hockey terms. And compared mm -hmm. to some of the other sports like uh, football and basketball, I think your efforts would be, you know, n not necessarily um, even talked about as out, as out of the ordinary. But what was part of your decision like earlier in your career? Because you do have this certain like lovability about you. You have this passion for the game that's so contagious. I think you're so relatable, um, mm -hmm. you know, especially when you came in a league because you looked like you were 15. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like what was part of the, uh, when the I took process? My shirt off. Yeah, you're uh, huge. Yeah. yeah. Or um, you just got fake tattoos. A little yeah, bigger, yeah, exactly. Whatever. Smart. I don't know. I mean, uh, it started in London. You know, obviously, it's pretty grateful to be in a, a very big hockey market in London. And everyone always talks about it being the NHL of the OHL and the smaller version of it. And, um, had a couple of people there come to me with, with deals that I thought were really cool and I took them and then come to the Toronto. I mean, it's the hot spot of market media and everything like that. And had a couple of big opportunities come to me. And I think for my side of it, when I'm doing these opportunities, it's looking at, uh, not just the brand and what it's done, but the relationship I can have with that brand. Um, you know, I never want to be going into something where I sign a deal with the, with a brand that. Two years later, I'm like, why did I do this? Why did I, why did I just sign with these people? So I think that's kind of the thing of where I'm at right now is just making sure that when I do these deals, I'm seeing the, the positive side of it and seeing an outcome that I'm, I'm really going to like and, and hopefully going forward to be with this, that, that brand for a long time. And I can just keep, you know, building their brand up from my side and they keep building my brand up from their side. So that's kind of how I always look at it and how we go about it. Well, you've always, you've always taken, I think you have this, you, know, you can come across as like, you know, playful and, and passion for the game, but you do have this um, respect for your legacy. And I do think you are in tune with, you, you don't, you're not just chasing a dollar. You want to align with brands that can help you in the community of Toronto, brands that you can help them in the community of Toronto. And it's been, you know, you have the, the Marner Assist Fund. I think that's something that I've been just as a friend of yours, like I've been so proud of your consistency of effort with that, your involvement, uh, frankly, the the celebrity of your marquee event, uh, the Mar Marner All Star Invitational. Like, I thought, uh, you know, I wasn't able to go um, last year, but I was going to mm -hmm. try and make it this summer. Mm -hmm. um, like, talk about your process in developing that. Yeah, it's uh, again, it's been from London, really. Uh, when I started going to the Sick Kids Hospital in London. Uh, me and Dvorak did it about once a week or once every two weeks if we had the time and, and able to go. And anytime we were able to go, we always went. It's something that we just really appreciated doing and, and loved doing. 
we started going there and making friendships with these kids and these families and um, just kind of seeing these kids just battle every day and, you know, coming in some weeks that they were out of the hospital that made you really proud was still sad that you didn't see them then. Um, and I think just from that moment on, when I got to Toronto, again, the bigger market, bigger media, I realized that I can start my own kind of charity and start my own kind of thing and, and start raising money for sick kids and, and other awarenesses that need to be, you know, seen. And, and uh, Natasha from It Factor, who you met, has she's got a lot of energy and she's great mm. and she helps out with everything. It keeps me on my toes with all of this, but she's been a big help through it all. Um, she's one that uh, was really, really helping me start this up and, you know, now we're almost in four years and it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been great. Built a lot of friendships through it. And, you know, seeing the donations we've been getting throughout these past couple of years has been amazing. And seeing the support from a lot of people that just keep coming back yearly to, to donate their money into this, into this great cause is, uh, it's, it's special really, you know, it's, it's it takes a lot of time for these people to build up, uh, you know, what they're doing for the company and for us. And we just really appreciate it. Well, that was something like, you talk about the hospital visits. Uh, a lot of people, I'm not sure, and it's not exactly that you hide it, but maybe, you know, just being a hockey player and, and you know, given your status, uh, you know, in the league, people may not realize just how sensitive you can be. And I mean that in like the highest compliment, like you're mm-hmm. a high EQ guy, emo- emotionally you're in tune with, um, you know, the ups and downs of of friends of yours. You, you, you know, would, you know, for example, as a teammate, you know, on tougher days, you were always, uh, you know, good to me. You were always trying to, you know, bump me up in, in, in my career, you know, but I, I, uh, I, I know in the, in the contract dispute, like, it's interesting people, um, there's a lot of tension on your contract, given the size and the team and, and who you are, you know, people may not understand, like my contract is heavily disputed. It's just, yeah. I'm not, in that marquee mark, uh, market mm-hmm. and I'm not, it's, it's not the total dollar amount. So it's like, I don't, I don't know if that was necessarily fair, you know, to who you are as a person, um, you know, the way there was some negative attention around it. And it, and it kind of, it's not that, uh, I knew you could weather the storm, but I just, mm-hmm. you know, from over here on my side of the fence, as a friend of yours, like, I know how much you love being a leaf. I know how much you love being a, a hockey player. Um, and I just know how in tune you are, you know, with the community. And I didn't think that, you know, that was necessarily always fair to you as a, as a player in person. But I do know that over the long haul, you're like, you'll win people over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it was my first contract ever and first kind of negotiating side of it. I, I really did stay out of it for most of it. Um, you know, you, you have agents for a reason. They they right. do the work, they do the dirty work, they do all the talking for you and they come back and tell you what they think of what the offer and what everything is. And I was letting Darren do it all. And I remember it was about uh, three or four days before training camp opened up. And um, finally I called Darren. I said, all right, let's just, let's get a meeting with Kyle. Let's get this, let's get talking. I want, I want to talk face to face. And Kyle really wanted to do that as well for the past week or so right before then. And so finally we said, all right, let's just get together. Let's get this talking. Like, let's get this thing, let's get this thing done pretty much. And, um, you know, my big emphasis was I didn't want to miss training camp. I didn't want to miss preseason games. I wanted to come in training camp, be with the whole team and do preseason with everyone and, and get my feet going and, and be ready to go for the season and help out. And when we met with them, you know, everything went great. We talked it out. Everything was smooth. Um, within the next I think it was like literally within the next 24 to 48 hours, the deal was done, signed. And, um, but that's why you have agents. They do all that dirty work. But yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was a process did you, for sure. Did you miss the treadmill test? No, I, I did that. So that's another I would have held out one more yeah. day. I would have found a way. Oh, no, buddy. It was, I, I can't even remember. I think it I was. I pulled a Zach Hyman was, and said my foot was sore or something. Yeah. It was after, I think it was after preseason. The treadmill was gone, but they had a bike test that was equivalent to it. So I did the bike test. Uh, I did the bike test that is sort of like the treadmill test, I guess. But um, you know, it's uh, it's obviously an interesting time. It was really, it was really interesting to be a part of it and see what uh, what a lot of people try to do to to kind of tear you down, I guess you could say, and you know, try and make you feel like you're not the player you are. And 
I mean, for me, I was just trying to stay off everything, just trying to just focus on going to the gym, working out, working out as hard as I can to try and just prove people wrong. And when I got on the ice, same thing, man, just, uh, I felt I was getting really frustrated at myself when I messed up drills. And that's, I think just because the pressure and everything I was putting on myself. And, uh, my longtime coach, Rob DeVoe from since I was four was the guy I always skate with. And, you know, he kind of just grabbed me and just said, Hey man, just calm down. Like no one's out here judging you. Like you're, you're a hockey player. You could do this. You're fine. Just have fun. Like enjoy everything. Enjoy all the moments you're getting and just take it day by day. Who cares what happens? Like just, just enjoy everything and everything's going to work out. So that's kind of how I took it from that day on is just whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And uh, just got to be ready for it really. Well, as a young pro, like I, I really, you know, commend you for the job you've done because you have had some of these other interests on the brand development side, on the, you know, how you give back to charity um, and your charitable functions, but you've always done a good job delegating. Like, and you know what your sweet spot is, is playing hockey and having mm-hmm. fun at the rink. And you've been able to grow your sense of focus uh, as your ambitions have gotten bigger, you know, as you've continued to grow. And I mean, I'm, I don't know, I guess as a, as a guy who was around for your rookie season, like I'm, I'm mm-hmm. proud of your development. It's not easy to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's been a, a little bit of a roller coaster ride from day one with with, uh, with Toronto, just, you know, the drafts and everything, not knowing what was going to happen really in that moment and knowing what pick or anything was going to happen. I mean, obviously our draft class was um, one that might go down as, you know, one of the top to ever do it. You know, if you look around, the, we had so many great players. So I think for kind of the whole, other than really the first two picks, man, the the rest was kind of just a toss up. I mean, mm-hmm. I think everyone was just kind of not knowing where they're going. And um, I remember I did get the phone call from Mark and, and Lindsay Hofford uh, a couple of days before that. If I was there, they're going to get me. But at the same time, I think that they were still in the back of my head that, you know, how many great players were in that, that draft and how many great players were on the board that, that could go ahead of me. And um, so I could think like in that moment there, I was so nervous, but um, just from that moment on, just going forward. I mean, I just knew the market you're getting yourself into. I grew up in this market, so I know exactly what goes on every day. You know, as a kid waking up sports net, sports center every day, seeing the Leafs constantly on, just flowing back and forth, commercials, TV, interviews, everything. So I knew what I was, what I was getting myself into. And I think just from that moment on, I just realized, you know, it's time to grow up quickly and you got to get your head on your shoulders quick. And you do handle the pressure of, of having to be the, the star that you are. Um, you know, with such grace and, and passion, but what is your favorite part is, of being a Toronto Maple Leaf? Oh, man. I don't uh, want to make you cry. I don't yeah, know, yeah, moment, no. Um, like, let's, yeah, yeah. No, I, the heavy I, I think, stuff. I, I don't know, man. I think just uh, relationships and, and friendships I've gotten throughout the years in, in Toronto, um, the fans I've got to meet that, uh, that have been with me really since London, I would mm-hmm. say, and maybe even a little bit before that, but I think that's just my the thing I really love is how many fans you got around, not just Toronto, but Ontario and Canada. You know, how many people really do watch the Leafs and are a fan of the Leafs in Canada and uh, something I really appreciate and really appreciate being a part of. Yeah, we got to see that a little bit when we travel for training camp too, you know, back in the day when we would go to Halifax and Niagara mm-hmm. and that, and you'd see just how excited people were to to see us. Um <laughs> You know, how have you dealt with, you know, sort of the transition? Because, you know, it, it, the team has had some turnover over the years. You know, you guys have, um, you know, given just the nature of the market and, you know, the fact that the team was still, uh, you know, sort of rebuilding. And then, you know, there's a change in GM, there's a change in coach. How have you managed, um, you know, to to stay consistent? And, and, and how have you managed to stay in touch with teammates that, you know, like Patty Marlowe, I know you're tight with Matt Martin, mm-hmm. myself. How have you managed to, you know, keep those relationships and still continue to be the leader in the room that you are now? Uh, I mean, I just think, you know, trying to, in the room wise, I just try and bring an energy that uh, is contagious and it, it brings a lot of energy around the room. And I think uh, that's something that I've always just tried to do is bring a lot of energy into the room, get everyone kind of fired up, get ready to go. And I guess just kind of stepping on the ice, just trying to do things on the ice that, you know, make other people want to do it. And I mean, trying to stay in touch with other teammates that you've been in the past with is hard sometimes because, you know, you get lost in all what's going on in your team and your season and everything like that. But I think the, I just try to do the best I can try to FaceTime, you know, all my guys once in a while, see how everyone's doing, check in. And, and then obviously, um, 
you know, you see, you see sports, you see the scores, you see what's happening. So, um, you know, that's another reason why, you know, I'm always just checking, seeing how my guys are doing, make sure everyone's doing well and pin up. Yeah, I always, I always appreciate it. Anytime I had a, a point or two or, or had a nice game and you got a chance to watch it, I'd get a text from you, which is just, I don't know, it's kind of cool when old teammates, cause it's sad, you know, I was, I was sad the day I got moved. Um, you know, I love New Jersey. I love the opportunity there, but you know, I'd spent a lot of time as a leaf dreaming of, you know, um, you know, Brendan Shannon's plan to have this long mm-hmm. run and I want to be a part of this window. You know, I, I, uh, I don't know if I've told this story, uh, publicly about, you know, similar to the Red Bull hats, you had mm-hmm. began working with Nike and Nike had sent you like a thousand shoes yeah. and yeah. we were the same size. And yeah. for weeks we were living at the same place in toronto and for weeks you were like hey sees you got to come grab like i dude i got too many gym shoes like they sent me like a bunch of the same color just like come mm-hmm. grab and see what you like and i, I was like yeah whatever I'll, I'll get to it like i'm not dying for another pair of gym <laughs> shoes but sure mitch i'll get over there mm-hmm. and then the day i get moved you and steph uh came to lexi and i's place and you know we were shook up i was i was mm-hmm. sad and and you were you were bombed as you know we were good friends and it was almost, I thought it was the, I thought it was funny. You, you brought this massive box of shoes and you're mm-hmm. like, it was almost like, I don't know what to do with this sad emotion, <laughs> but like, here's some gym shoes. Yeah. Best of luck out there. <laughs> yeah. I, I do recall that actually. I remember I was trying to get you over so many times to try and see what shoes you want to take. And then I remember uh, when the move did happen, you guys told us, I remember me and Steph were like, all right, we're packing up the box. <laughs> Let's bring it over. You were only like, I mean, it was like a minute walk. It was literally through yeah. the hallway, and then we were there. So I was like, pack up the box. We're taking it over. Whatever ones he doesn't want, we'll just take back here, and we'll give them to your brother, or we're giving them to my cousins or something. Steph's like, all right, sounds good. So I remember we took over, it, and it was honestly probably, it probably was like 10 shoes. You were like, dude, I can't fit all these in my bag. Like, what do you, what do you think I'm doing here? Like, I can't take all this right now. I was like, all right, well, take the ones you want, and the other ones will be wait whenever you want them. So I do recall that, and, you know, that was a tough time, obviously. Um, you guys were in our building. Steph and Lexi hung out a lot. And mm-hmm. I mean, we, we didn't have Zeus at that time, I guess. But I remember Hoax was a big, uh, big supporter of me and Steph. He, you know, cuddling all the time with us. And that was something that we loved too. So I do remember when you told us, you know, it was kind of heartbreaking news. But I think, uh, you know, we were excited for you because you got an opportunity to go play again mm-hmm. on a team that, you know, wanted you there. And I think I was really just excited for you as well as, as bummed for, you know, having you leave. And who, you know, since I've left uh, Leafland, who has taken over? Are you guys still playing Catan? Because who's beating you nowadays that Brownie and I are out of town? Yeah, no, man. No one's really playing. Uh, the Halls, we've got to get the Halls playing here soon. Um, I mean, throughout this quarantine, we haven't been able to play with anyone, obviously. Yeah, it so, uh, what, ha- what have you been doing, like, for training and stuff, just for, for young players out there mm-hmm. who might be wanting to know? You know what a player like yourself is trying to do to get ready because there's there's no none of us are skating right now so that's a huge missing piece in our training but what have you been up to on the on the training side yeah uh i got a couple uh dumbbells here and and med balls and stuff like that so my uh gym coach from day one really as well has been sending me workouts and then we've been doing zoom calls twice or three times a week as a gym group so i've been doing that but I've been doing the Peloton as well. I, I, you know what? It's always like people say about keeping your conditioning up. There's no really way of keeping game-like conditioning up unless you're playing hockey games. It's, no. it's impossible. Um, I've came to that conclusion. Even skating, you know, for multiple weeks, I still think when you get in that first game, you're going to feel like crap. So Totally agree. Um, I, I'm just trying to stay active, trying to just keep my blood moving, trying to keep my, my, my body, I guess you know, kind of jelly like it usually is moving wise and smooth. So uh, doing a lot of stretching as well. Uh, we got the hockey net out in front. I got some rollerblades now, a stick and a ball. So I've been going out there hour or so a day, just just stick handling, shooting, shooting the ball in the net, just kind of feeling like my shot's an absolute weapon when it's going to be really <laughs> interesting when I get back. I need to start handling some pucks here soon or else I'm going to be start, uh, my shot's going to get worse somehow through quarantine. Yeah, what are, what, you know, as a player, you know, and I do know just in talking to you, you are very passionate about your loyalty to, you know, the coaches that have been uh, most responsible for helping you in your development as a kid. Um, what's kind of the next stage to your game? Like, what are you really trying to add, um, you know, next for you professionally? Um, that's hard. I mean, like, you know, the, the really award that I think 
I would be really cool to win and really cool to be acknowledged for even as the Selkie. I mean, I just think the, the names that are always in the Selkie are guys that everyone is just um, scared of on the ice, I guess you could say. You know, the guys that you know you're going to play against them and it's going to suck because regardless of what zone you're in, they're going to absolutely, you know, work you really. And um, it's always the guys that work the hardest and something like that. So I think that's just the one thing that I, I want to try and set a goal to is trying to get that one day or, or try and be acknowledged for it. And um, like I said, I think the guys always in there are just really good competitors, really good on both sides of the ice and guys that you know it's going to be a hard night regardless of where you're at. Well, I want to pump your tires too much because you're an opponent now. But like, I do know, <laughs> I I saw it when we played together. Like, you do have a relentless, a rel- a, r- 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 <laughs> a relentlessness on the puck. Um, just given your skating ability, your energy level on the ice, you you don't tire easily. Um, you know, you have great hand eye to knock pucks down and things like that. I know you're you're still killing, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I saw it when you first. Uh, you know, I don't know if you're still doing it, but like. When you first came in the league, you were so determined to prove, you know, to Lou Lamarillo and Mike Babcock that you could play and be responsible on the defensive side of the puck. Like you were, I was actually concerned for you at the rate at which you were blocking shots. You look like Ian <laughs> LaPerriere out there, like diving in front of the pill. And I'm like, you know, I, I love it. Um, but I'm just hoping you don't, you know, break a foot or anything like that. Mm-hmm. That's, that's who's, who, who's helping you with that? Um, I know it's an inner decision, but. Mm-hmm. You know, what are you doing, uh, you know, video-wise and things like that, try and see where you can be better getting the puck back? Um, well, I think the big thing for me is, you know, tracking or, or trying to steal pucks when someone's on the fort, like going the opposite way of you. Um, Connor Brown style? Yeah, Connor Brown the style. The lizard exactly. going? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I usually think uh, if you can steal a puck with someone going up the ice on your side, you know, and you turn back quickly, uh, there's a high chance for an odd man rush. Or, you know, miscommunication between the guys on the ice. It's, uh, I would say it's just confusion. When, when someone steals a puck from you in the neutral zone and quickly turns back on you, I mean, you would know as a defenseman, it, it's just kind of chaotic. Like, you don't know who's going to take who. You don't have any who. time to set your gap up. Yeah, if someone's, like, usually people are going to try and get a change there. So it's just, I think uh, that's something I really try and work on. It's just, regardless of, shifts you know trying to make sure your shift line's obviously short so you can keep doing it every single shift you get out there but um i don't know just something i've always liked to do man i just like stealing pucks trying to make something out, out of it and make something good of it and you know if you had to do it all over again you know your development as a as a kid you know obviously you did a lot of things right to evolve into the player you've you've become a boot but i know you get this question a lot uh you know what advice do you have for young players trying to build their game um, no, no matter what their size is, you know, you are on the smaller mm-hmm. end. Uh, what advice do you give younger players trying to be like well, you, honestly? Well, I mean, I, I would just give the advice of don't, don't give up on your dream. Like, uh, work hard as, as much as you can. Um, you know, make sure when no one's watching, you're still doing the work. I mean, it's not all about fame and, and celebrity. Yes, I guess you could say it's, it's about what you do behind the curtains. It's what you do when no one's really looking, uh, how you do it. Um, you know, I think, uh, growing up as a kid for me, it was a lot of naysayers or doubters. I mean, I remember I got drafted to London. I think I was five, six, 125 pounds or something like that. And you know, you're looking at today's OHL drafts and the average trade's got to be around 5'11 and weight's got to be around 190. So, um, it was kind of like that, I guess in my draft too. But I mean, I think the thing is just, you know, if you work like a dog and you know, the coaches are going to like that. You know, if you don't grow into your size, you know how to, I'd say, play in those small areas, get the puck out of those small areas and make something out of it. I think that's kind of where I I really grown as I was a really small player. So I had to learn how to dodge players and and learn how to keep my feet moving, get away from corners or walls to keep the puck and keep my feet going and and create plays. And, you know, I've kind of grown up, obviously, and kind of starting now to hopefully starting now to look like I'm building out a little bit more. (laughs) We'll see. but um, I think that's just the thing of what's been great for me is that now I'm a little taller. I, I can now, you know, do those battles and, and still keep my feet moving and get off the wall. But I would just say, you know, don't listen to any doubters. It's always going to be doubt. People doubt you regardless of who you are in, in life. And, um, you know, I think the best thing is, is just when you get to prove those doubters wrong and, you know, one day you're going to get to look the same people in the face and 
you know, you don't even have to say anything. They just know that they just, they screwed up and that, you know, you can just sit there and just chest out Puffy and yeah, you know, turn TSN on, t- turn TSN on tonight and check the top 10 out. Um, mm-hmm. I actually remember that when you got drafted uh, to the OHL, I remember seeing literally your size <clears throat> and, and weight and thinking, mm-hmm. you know, cause I was playing the OHL at the time and I was just checking the, the first round and that I was like, wow, kid must be a player <laughs> like <laughs> at that size. And I was always so amazed at your ability to, you know, when, it, when people ask me, what was it like playing with Mitchie? I say he had this ability to like Rubik's cube, the game where you had this, um, you would invite people towards you. You weren't, uh, nervous about traffic. You could go into traffic. You could, you could get away from traffic. You're really good at creating your own ice. Like you'd come off the wall, you'd pick up a puck. You'd like lean on your defender, all buck 58 of you. Mm-hmm. And you'd like lean in and then, you know, create your own ice to the cutback. Uh, it's actually, I remember when I saw your size uh, in the OHL draft, Connor Brown, who we both, you know, is a close friend of ours, used to whine about how small he was and why he went so late in the yeah, OHL yeah. draft. And the facts are, he just, I mean, you were smaller and you went higher than he did. So Brownie, <laughs> like, I think you're full of it. Um, a couple of Red Tilson award winners, though. Yeah. Not a no, big he's deal. Not afraid, he won't, we're not afraid to say it. No. Every once in a while, though. We got to buzz the tower, give himself to defend himself when he finally gets on the, uh, yeah. on the pod. Um, how are you doing with the, uh, what are you up to on Twitch right now? Cause I know nothing about, I talked a little bit with Himes and E11 gaming. Yeah. What are you, uh, doing in the gaming world right now? Um, yeah. So I got a little setup right now, actually in the, in the bar corner, but, uh, just waiting on a room to get opened up and then I'm going to move everything in there and get kind of the more legit setup going with the actual desktops and a um, couple different TVs going and try and make actually a thing out of it. But, um, I don't know. I kind of started up just to, I guess, stay in touch with people, touching fans, kids I could watch. I mean, obviously right now, a lot of kids are just doing schoolwork and um, playing video games or watching videos. I mean, watching video games. Um, I know that's what I mean. I've been doing. I've just been watching video games, watching kind of game clips and stuff like that. And um, so I started it up, uh, saw how I was going to go. And uh, now I'm at the case where I can get donations from people on the Twitch that are watching me. And um, so it's been really cool. We've added our Marner Assist Fund into it. So now when people donate, it goes to the charity again. So everything that's, that's getting awesome. donated to us is going right to the charity. And um, so it's been really cool seeing people, um, you know, come in and donate their own money and, you know, say what, how great everything is and all that. So that's been a lot. Uh, it's been pretty cool kind of still talking to my fans and still being able to talk to them and see how everyone's doing. And it's just kind of a way to get everyone's mind off of what's going on, I would say. It's something for me, I really enjoy playing video games. Um, trying not to swear as much as I can on Twitch. It's been really hard. <laughs> um, you know me, sometimes I can get real heated. You get competitive, yeah. Yeah, so um, it's, been, it's been funny because the stream knows when I want to swear. And, and yeah, it. I'm like, I start saying the word and then I just kind of just blank it. I just quit. I just stop speaking. And then I look at, there's comment section. So everyone's commenting and saying stuff and they're all talking to each other, talking to me, asking me questions. And it's hilarious after that happens. Everyone's like, oh, watch out. And it's like, everyone's doing the same thing and it's, it's just hilarious. But it's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. It's, it's another way to talk to people, um, show people that I'm, I'm actually half decent at gaming. And sometimes I have a really bad day or sometimes I have a really good game. So it's just been a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Well, and again, it's like you're doing a really nice job of leveraging something you love um and and sort of your attention for you know charitable causes that um you know mean a lot to you uh when people do donate to the martyr assist fund talk about uh with us the different um who receives some of that money and and what projects are they going towards right now yeah uh well the projects right now was a kid's help phone and uh with Burger Priest and True Hockey we also were helping out sending meals to frontliners frontline workers Firefighters, Priest. Priest. yeah, what a they, spot. Burger Priest's been great. They've uh, been a lot of help, and same as True Hockey. Both those two um, have been very generous with what they've been helping us with, and so we've been getting meals out to the frontline workers in that regards. And then uh, the kids' help fund. I mean, right now it's a tough time for a lot of kids. Can't go to school, hang out with their friends. A lot of birthdays coming up. You know, can't hang out with their friends on their birthdays or do stuff that they want to do. So I think the important thing of that was just telling people that you know. You're not alone in anything. There's always someone to call, talk to, and, and go to if you ever need anything. And, you know, sometimes people feel like they can't talk to families or, or loved ones about stuff. And, you know, I think uh, 
the thing I was just trying to encourage is that whatever you're fighting, whoever you want to talk to, um, there's always going to be someone on that phone that it's going to answer and talk to and be able to, you know, make sure that you're heard and, and know what's going on. Well, that, that was um, a really nice letter you put out on Twitter too, just kind of letting kids know what that you're in it with them, mm-hmm. you know, what resources they may have available um, out there. And, you know, just that sense of social service, I guess, uh, you know, it shouldn't take anyone by surprise now, given you've been uh, so engaged with the, the community around Toronto. Um, you know, I'm, I've, I've been proud of you as a friend, just, you know, your, your, your quiet sense of leadership, your ability to blend, you know, things that you already love and do so that it's not some extra effort or, or feels difficult for you to do. But, um, I mean, that's awesome, Mitchie. Truly is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a lot um, of fun. I do want to know, you know, just over your course of your time as a Leaf, you know, when you try to think back to some of your most favorite moments, what <clears throat> sticks out to you? Oh, um, you know, I think uh, that first game at the ACC, at the time it was the ACC, I think that was, you know, one of my all-time favorites. I had a lot of family, friends that were there that I grew up playing hockey with or um, new through hockey that we're all there watching and, and seeing everyone after the game was was a lot of fun. Obviously, it was when I first scored my first goal in that game too. So there's another moment that I got to share with a lot of loved ones. So that was really uh, that was really cool to be a part of. And the other one that I I say that was one of my favorites is I think it was our I think after that game we went to Chicago or maybe it was a day or so later we went to Chicago and we played in the Madhouse. And I remember I went and watched a playoff game there in the Stanley Cup Finals, and I remember how crazy it was. And I remember me, Bozy, JVR started. And the guy growing up I always watched was Patty Kane. That's he's the guy that just I idolized seeing how he worked around the puck and how we looked around the ice. And I remember I looking across and, you know, on the other side, their starting lineup was like Seabrook, Keith, Kane, Panarin, and I can't remember who was playing at center at that time. It might have been Anis- Anisimov there at the time playing center with that line, but I, I can't even remember. But I remember just lining up beside those guys and just remembering, you know, how cool it was and how cool of a moment. You know, I actually remember that now. And I remember uh, Mike Babcock had this cool, he had this unreal pregame speech. I got to give it to him where he goes, uh, I, I, I think he was talking to, we had a lot of young guys uh, mm-hmm. that night, you know, we had a young yeah. team. We were, it was kind of the beginning of the rebuild. A couple of us had played the year before. You know, like when I got traded there and that, but it was something about um, still playing Chicago at home and, and just giving all their success. He was like, uh, he said something like, you know, guys, if, if you want autographs, you know, get it over with during warm because when the puck drops, it's for real tonight. And I just thought that fired me up so much. I was so mm-hmm. jacked for that game. Uh, and, and I mean, I, you always reminded me of, of Kaner, just your ability to like see traffic you know, look around it, see what's on the backside. Um, you know, I always loved, uh, you know, when I played with you, if I was the fourth man in a rush and I, I did my skating to get open, there was always a chance I was going to get a good look because uh, you're going to find me. Um, you know, as you, uh, as you continue, you know, to, to build your, your leadership role uh, as a Leaf, you know, what was the honor of getting a letter this past year? Because I remember making sure I watched that game, um, you know, just to see what was going on with that. You know, mm-hmm. talk about, you know, what that was like skiing on the ice with a letter for the first time. Uh, yeah, no, it was, it was really cool. I mean, it's something that, it's hard, you know, you obviously don't want to lie about, but, um, you know, it's something that was really cool. Uh, growing up watching this team, watching, you know, the Sundeans, Clarks, the Gilmores, seeing all those guys and seeing what they meant to the city and seeing what they did to this city is something that, uh, you know, for, for me, it was really inspiring and really cool to see. And then, you know, kind of getting that call from Kyle. I remember he called me, Matt, Mo, and Johnny into the office. I think JT already knew at the time. I think they had like a little separate thing just to mm-hmm. show that he was a captain. Um, so I think he wasn't surprised. But I remember he, they called us three, us four up and, you know, kind of told us what was going to happen. and. I think just kind of uh, for for me and Matt, it was a really cool moment just to kind of share. I mean, we kind of came in together. We've been through a um, couple ups and down years that uh, have, haven't gone the way I'd say we want it to, especially, I mean, Mo's been there, but Mo's been there obviously a lot longer than us too. Um, and JT's obviously older and has been through the grind with New York and, and, and done all that stuff. So he, he, I think, knew the responsibility and everything going, but 
think for me and Matt, it was kind of just uh, an eye opener of knowing that, you know, we got to be a leader. I mean, obviously that doesn't mean just screaming your head off and being an idiot. I think, you know, the big thing is just kind of going out on the ice and proving that we can do the right things and trying to do the right things constantly over and over that are going to try and inspire others. And, um, I think as saying that we knew it was going to be a big responsibility now in the media, everyone's going to make a big story out of it and everyone's going to start criticizing it and stuff like that. And for us, it's just making sure we, we did our part and, and going out there doing the job that we needed to do. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and I mean, you know, in terms of the media stuff, uh, I, I would get asked that question, you know, in Toronto, is it hard to play there with the media? And like, I, I used to joke, I'm like, listen, guys, I'm not a hundred point guy. I don't have to deal with, you know, these sort of questions day in, day out. Um, but you are, you know, a, you know, close to a hundred point guy. You had 94 last year. You were, you know, tearing it up this year uh, prior to the pause. How is it, how do you manage, you know, your relationship and sort of just the pressure of the media, um, given that you are someone that has to answer to them every day? Like, how do you maintain your focus and, and keep your energy level up day in, day out with that? Every answer I do is trying to make about the team, trying to always exclude myself. I mean, just everything about team. I mean. You know, you don't win games by yourself, no matter what. Everything's, Especially not in our game. No, 100%. Everything comes from a team's perspective. So I think, you know, I always try and when people ask me certain questions about myself and points totals and, you know, if I'm mad about point totals or anything like that, I think the big picture is just seeing how our team's doing. I mean, our team was going through a little roller coaster ride, so that was something I wasn't thrilled about. And um, as a leader, you know that. That's one of your responsibilities, making sure that you, you guys can calm it down and calm this kind of roller coaster ride down. And I think we were doing that at the end of this, or well, when this kind of quarantine started. Um, but I think the great thing about our team also was that we were playing our best hockey against the best teams that we were playing against. And we brought it every night against the best teams. And, you know, talking about that roller coaster ride, when we weren't playing teams that were high up in the standings, it felt like we just kind of, you know, deflated a little bit. And that's something you don't want as a team. And something that I think we're getting better with, but something we needed to get better with as well going forward and going into the playoffs and things like that. But the media is hard, obviously. You know, going into Toronto that they're big. Like I said, growing up here, I saw everything on Sports Center, and I knew what it was going to be like. So it's uh, it's been fun, though. I mean, I got a lot of relationship with people in the media and, and talking to them, and it's always fun conversations with certain people. And like I said, for others, there's always a scrum. So you're always doing the same questions. It's just trying to forward questions onto the full team other than yourself. I mean, no one wants to be looking as just uh, a selfish guy. And I think for my side, it's when something I need to own up to, I, I own up to it. And, you know, I take the blame for it. It's something that, you know, I'm trying to get mature, I guess, more mature with. Well, and it's, you know, there are pros and cons, right? Like uh, you do want to play in a market, every player, you don't dream of playing in a half full building. You want mm -hmm. to play, you know, in a, in a rink that's jam-packed. You want to play in front of fans that, you know, love and bleed, you know, the colors of your team. Uh, and also, you know, when it comes to, and that comes with media, right? Like there's, there's a lot of fans. There's usually a bigger media following for the team. There's pros and cons too, right? So, you know, you, you play a poor game, you're going through a contract to speed, like it's going to be highly covered, but yeah. you know, it's also like you can, you can build some of these relationships where, uh, you can, you know, benefit when you try to like bring attention, for example, to causes that you care about, you know, hmm. um, like I was really grateful in, uh, you know, as I started this podcast, I had some, you know, I was always trying to be respectful. And again, I wasn't near even, you know, half as much in the limelight as you and Matt's and, and Morgan and JT and that. Uh, but, you know, they would cover the podcast and release a story about it. And, and I guess I was, I was, I was grateful of it. Um, I haven't had, you know, some of the attention that you have, but there are pros and cons to it. Yeah, definitely. No, that's something about uh, Toronto that you just kind of know about going into it is the pros and cons. I mean, it's still funny. It's still recalled the, the day I got drafted, the excitement I had and everything going on. And I remember Steve Keel called me. You know Steve. He's a PR mm -hmm. guy. He's the guy that is, uh, uh, he, he's the guy that, you know, he'll call you if anything's bad. <laughs> and I remember he called me and I was, I was still new. So I didn't really know exactly what the call was about. And I remember I answered it. Hey, go, hey Steve, like, what's up? He goes, Hey, like you got to delete all your tweets. I'm like, Oh, what's up? He's like, uh, he's like, people are going back to 2012 on your Twitter and like retweeting your tweets and screenshotting your tweets. And obviously, you know, that's what, eight years ago now. Um, you know, I was just a kid that was starting in high school and just being an idiot on Twitter and being stupid and tweeting stuff that I thought was funny. You know, I never really, 
I had the dream of obviously playing in the NHL, but I, I never thought that would be a reason <laughs> yeah, of coming. Yeah, yeah. That would never come out or never be shown. And I remember, I remember after that phone call, I sent Steve all my tweets. We deleted every single one of them. Started kind of fresh slate from like 2017, from kind of our second year in London, I think it was forward. And I, I recall, you know, him just being like, "Yeah, like, you know, kind of get used to it. This is how it is." And I'm like, "Okay, sounds good." Like that was my kind of first warning is. People going back to 2012 and being like, "Hey, screw you, man! We're gonna we're gonna get you right away. We're gonna we're gonna expose you right away." And uh, but it's it's something a funny story that I don't know if I've ever really told or anything like that. But it's just kind of a funny one. I always go back to and see. Yeah, welcome to Leafland. Yeah. Um, you know what was a moment? You know, every player I think uh, you talk so long about how bad you want to make it. You know, you and I both know just the the hours in the car, the the sacrifice for tournaments that families make, the um, just the sheer amount of effort and passion and tears that goes into an NHL career. You know, like uh, a big moment I had, you know, was my first NHL game was in my hometown. It was in Chicago, and a lot of my uh, family was able to be there. Like I would say that, and then maybe the draft were two moments where. You know, as a family, we were really able to be together and sort of celebrate just the progress we'd made, you know, pick our head up above, you know, all the hard work and just trying to, you know, our, our efforts to, to be more and, and, you know, establish uh, a firmer corner in, the, in, in, this, in this game. You know, what has been, um, you know, one of your favorite moments to share with your family, you know, in your still young career? Uh... I think the draft would have to be that my favorite. I mean, because at the draft, I remember I had all my, I would say all the people that really sacrificed a lot of time and 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 money for what I was trying to accomplish. And um, I remember you know kind of getting the name called. I, I actually remember sitting in the chair in Florida, and you know I, I remember Toronto got to pick up, and I remember I was just shaking, just like my feet, my hands. I was just like kind of just like just wouldn't stop moving. I was just hitting everything. I remember my dad kind of just grabbed me. He goes, "Hey, it happens. It happens. If not, whatever. Like we'll go some. Like we're going somewhere else. It's fine. You're you're gonna you're gonna be fine regardless." And I'm like, "Okay." Like that kind of calmed me down. And then I remember Toronto got up there, and Mark went over to the mic, and I was thinking in my head, "There's no way Mark's gonna speak on the mic and not say my name." I just remember I was like, "I've been with this guy technically for three years. Like this guy has been in my corner for a long time. Like there's no way I don't go to Toronto." And I remember he called my name and just kind of sharing that, that moment with my family, giving the hugs out to my brother and mom and, and my dad, um, just seeing the joy on their face. And then after kind of going into the, I guess, family room, you could call it after the drafts. I don't, I don't know what you, I don't mm -hmm. know how you would call it, but um, kind of that family room and seeing everyone in there that um, have sacrificed a lot of time for me and seeing how happy and joyful they were. And I actually still recall that uh, Arizona's pick was before Toronto's and uh, Arizona didn't make it clear to anyone of who they were going to pick. They, they told Strom, I think, separately, one-on-one, -on -one, but they told him to keep it really quiet, and I think like they kind of threatened him if it got out that it was possibly not going to happen, that he was going to mm -hmm. go. And to my, to my side, um, Arizona kind of said, oh, it's a throw in the air. We don't know who we're taking yet. It's going to be a draft day decision. And I was like, okay, like, what, what's going on? So again, Arizona's pick is before Toronto, so I'm sitting there nervous as hell again. And I remember they picked Strom, and I remember I couldn't hear them, but my, all my cousins, uncles, and all the people that were also there with me cheered so loud that people thought that they were with Strom. <laughs> and <laughs> um, because they thought, they thought now I'm going to Toronto. Like they thought there was a really good chance of it, which ended up happening. But I remember they told me afterwards, they're like, people came up to them and were like, oh, like, are you with Strom? Like, is that, is, are you guys family of Strom? Are you friends? And they're like, oh, no, we're, we're with Marner. And they're like, oh, okay. Like, what, what the hell is like, what are you guys cheering for then? Like, pretty much. But I remember it's just because, you know, everyone wanted me back here at home and uh, wanted me playing for the Blue and White that, you know, kind of we all drew up of yeah, that yeah, dream of dream, playing man. for the hometown. Yeah. So, um, and that was just kind of the really cool moment. I still really remember is that how happy everyone was to get that name called by Toronto and to be a part of this team and franchise. It's so cool, like just how pivotal that draft day is to, you know, for all the players that get to experience. Like I remember my draft was in Pittsburgh and, uh, you know, so every time uh, Philly, my, my whole family, my mom, dad, my younger brother, Blake, my youngest brother, Hunter, and we're sitting there 
And every time Philly and Washington would pick, the whole the fans would uh, would boo, you know, because mm-hmm. Pittsburgh those yeah, are yeah. big rivals. And and I I remember saying something like off the cuff. My youngest brother was getting bored. You know, I was on day two. He's just mm-hmm. kind of listening to names rattle off. He doesn't know any of the players and kind of the novelty had worn off. And he goes, uh, he, he starts booing with the fans every time <laughs> Philly and Washington would pick. And I'm like, Hunty, like, hey man you know, tighten up. Like what if, you know, what if I, you know, go to one of those teams, you know? Mm. So sure enough, we, I get taken by Washington. We do the same thing. We go up in the family suite. Yeah. It's just amazing the way you remember it. Like, uh, I met, you know, Chandler Stevenson, uh, you know, for the first time, who was their third round pick that year, you know, he ends up standing up in my wedding as one of my you know best friends as a, as a Hershey bear. And, I remember embarrassing Hunter. I'm like, you know, meet, he's meeting George McPhee, the general manager, and Ross yeah. Mahoney and Steve Richmond, you know, from player development. And I'm like, hey, just so you guys know, like, my younger brother was uh, booing you guys about a half hour ago. <laughs> you know, so it was, it was just funny to, to embarrass yeah. him. But um, yeah, it's, it's funny how it goes by so fast in the moment. But nowadays, you can look back and remember all the small things that happened. It's, uh, it's pretty, pretty incredible. Did anybody, was anybody in that suite? Did anybody call you any of the Leaf greats right after? Um, I don't think right after. Um, I, I mean, I saw Wendell around the city a little bit, kind of just OHL games, I believe it was. And then um, and then uh, after I got drafted, it was actually James Reimer that called me. And that's who okay. I talked to very first on the phone. And he, he welcomed me to the team and said all the congrats and everything like that. And um, that was the first... Leaf player I talked to was James Reimer actually at the time. So we talked we talked a little bit about some of your favorite moments. What has been we'll call them a learning opportunity. What has been your greatest learning opportunity as a Leaf? Because there has been um, there are a lot of ups and downs in this game. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think one is to uh, never grade your teammates on their work ethic and practice. Yeah. <laughs> Well documented. <laughs> yeah. Where was yeah, I on that you, list? That's what this whole podcast is about. You were you were up there, I think. But I had to work um, hard. Yeah, it wasn't good um, enough not to. <laughs> yeah, no that that one is definitely the top. Uh, that was a funny that was one tough. that came out there. But you know, I think those are the moments you kind of you look back on, and laugh at. I mean, uh, obviously, I was a rookie. I was really young. I was really nervous. I didn't know what to do, so I did it. Next thing I knew, it got you know kind of reported to the team and. You were there, you know, Bozy, yep. Javier, and Naz. Those three are one of the best guys that I've ever played with. Um, they've been great throughout my career talking to them and stuff like that. And, um, you know, it's hilarious. At first, they were jiving me about it because I didn't yeah. know that it was going to get shown to them. Yeah, expected and, it to be private. Yeah, and then it got, uh, I think, you know, I think his lesson was trying to just showed the older guys that, you know, I'm a young guy and I'm looking up to these three and that's what was happening. Obviously, it didn't come out that way, but I think that's what the goal was for him. But whatever, like it happened, you know, it was a growing moment for me. The three guys that that ended up, you know, getting told this were the three best guys that could have been told because they didn't care. They they were on my side. They they knew that you know I had to do what I had to do there, and um, all three of them, you know, still to this day, I talked to quite a bit and always still jive me about that moment and how funny it is and everything like that. But um, you know, I was just very grateful that it was those three, I guess you can say, that I still talk to quite a bit and get uh, get chirped for every once in a while from them. When I was there that year, um, you know, when you you were on the you know fourth line for a bit and this had gone on, you know, it was a, it was a trying season at times. But, like, one of the things I always, you know, I guess was a, a tribute to your character, just sort of a proof of, of your desire to win and, and your team first mentality was, like, I remember – when you were you were playing with uh was it Marty and Ben Smith? Yeah. Like I I I, I, I literally remember you doing things, for example, to play to their strengths. Like you're not a you're not a dump and chase guy. You know, you're usually a puck carrier <clears> and, and you want to make plays off the rush and and do those kind of things. And I remember like how many times you had made like and, and maybe the average fan, you know, may or may not notice it, you know, pretty smart fans up in, in Toronto for the most part in terms of you know, how they know the game, but like you would make a nice soft chip into a D-man's corner just so Marty could go tee a guy up. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. I always thought that, uh, you know, I, I don't think people ever, you know, talk about, um, 
you know, how Mitch, he played his role as a fourth liner, you know, when this is all mm-hmm. said and done for the, for the little bit of time that you did. But I always just, I don't know, I guess uh, I had a little bit more respect for you. I, I already had a tremendous amount of respect for you as a player, but I was just impressed with like, wow, this guy is still, you know, I'm, I'm sure he's not happy with his opportunity right now, but he's still mm-hmm. doing the best he can to make his line mates, you know, play to their strengths. And I was so impressed with that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, obviously having the guy that led the NHL on hits in a couple of years, it's going to be a little scary for some D-man going back to chase that puck. So I, I still recall, you know, I was one to actually tell Marty like, hey, so you know, I'm going to be laying just burgers into corners and I'm going to let you <laughs> tee off. And I told him, I was like, I was like, so you know, I'm going to be following behind you closely and all I'm going to try and do is just poke a puck. And I said, if you can poke it, I said, poke it. I said, I'm going to talk to you to tell you where, I, where I'm going to be. If you can poke it that way, then I'll be there to take it and I'll be ready to try and make a play off it. If not, I'll be coming into your feet. Just try and hold the guy there after you hit him or whatever. And, you know, it's something that uh, I really actually enjoyed playing with Marty. I tell people this all the time is that I really did love playing with Marty because he scared the shit out of people. He would, f- he would protect us, obviously, as you saw. Yep. He, he, was, he was a protector. He was a, he was a big brother role model kind of figure. And he was a guy that, you know, would stand in front of the net and take that beating and not care. You know, he was, he was all for me shooting a puck off of his leg or his mm. ass. And he didn't care. He just, he wanted to do what, uh, what would make our team win. And that's something that I really appreciated from his side. And, you know, it's uh, something that I still remember to this day. It's just, you know, how, how big of a mentor he was of just trying to teach me the right way to play and, and win. Well, let's show, let's show Marty some love because he is yeah. one of my all-time favorite teammates. And it's funny. When I got traded to um, the Leafs, you know, Mike Babcock used to coach that, uh, the sting thing, right? Where you try to, mm-hmm. you know, bug people and physically touch them in the neutral zone and that. Yeah. And so I, you were you, you were still uh, scoring 2,000 points with London. <laughs> and uh, we were playing the Islanders. And, you know, I matched up a lot against, you know, with Marty's line. And mm-hmm. I kept stinging them in the neutral zone. Yeah. And, uh, and it got to a point, he told me the story later. It got to a point where Marty was so annoyed with me, you know, getting in his grill in the neutral zone yeah. that he watched my fights in between periods. And I think he watched the wrong Carrick. I think he watched Sam Carrick's yeah, fights yeah. actually. Uh, and we didn't end up going that day, but my joke with Marty, when he told me this story the next year, cause he signed with the Leafs and they were both on the team. Um, and he was awesome to me. Like you just felt two feet taller with him around always. Mm-hmm. He, he just had this way of making you feel comfortable by yourself. And, and, uh, but he told me, he's like, you know, just so you know, like, I'm not sure you know this, but we almost fought last year. Like I was going to jump you and beat the piss out of you. <laughs> and, uh, I said, Marty, well, I, I'm, you know, I would have hated to have to hand you your first loss, but, yeah. um, you know, you know, just because I was trying to make an impression, mm-hmm. I would have probably said yes to the fight. Like we would have fought. Yeah. Um, but talk about like, what was he, uh, as a friend to you as a teammate? Because I know what he meant to me. Mm-hmm. Us three hung out a lot. Um, I think the world of him, I sing his praise every chance I get, but mm-hmm. you know, uh, how was, uh, how instrumental was he in your, in your first year as a, as a close friend? Uh, yeah, you know, he was huge. I mean, at that time, Steph was still in London, so she wasn't around that much. Um, she was up on weekends every once in a while depended on schooling schedule, obviously. And um, I had my mom there quite a bit as well, but the, the people I hung out with was obviously you, Lexi, and then uh, Sid and Matt. Uh, both of, all four of you were the kind of two couples that we hung out with a lot and together. Mm-hmm. And um, I just remember kind of any, any off day or anything that, you know, we could have got together with someone. Marty was always texting me and saying, hey, like, what are you up to? Like, if you're not up to anything, like we're doing this, if you want to come, if you want to do this, we're here. And I just remember anything he did that it was a text for me. And, you know, like we, like you said, uh, the first year for me in here was kind of a roller coaster ride and, and ups and downs and a lot of, you know, kind of confusing times, I guess you could say. And, um, you know, I'd say that he was a big part of just kind of keep calming me down and keep telling me, you know, it's going to happen. Nothing you can do about it. Then just go out and kind of play hockey and, and do what you're here to do. And, um, I think the big thing from him was just, regardless of what line you're on, just go out and, play your game like you're going to get the opportunity eventually and you know just make the most of it when you do get that opportunity and and then I remember finally the opportunity to come that uh that I you know I kind of rose up to and and played to yeah and I mean I I learned a lot from Marty and and you know we were scratched a bit there at the end of our you know sort of leave tenure and and uh just the professionalism with with 
with which he handled it every day. Like he knew uh, he wasn't happy with the way things were were going, but he showed up at the rink every day, you know, practice hard, uh, manage his, his bag skate. I remember one time in Nashville, we were actually deep partners together and I wasn't happy with his gap control that day, but I knew he was trying. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of two on two yeah. drills turned into two on ones. But um, one of the things I tried to steal from Marty is you know, you are in the NHL season, you're playing so much, you're on the road a lot. And as a young player, uh, you're, you're away from your family. It can be lonely at times, mm-hmm. especially if you don't have, you know, a girlfriend or significant other, you know, around with you. Uh, and I felt like Marty did a really nice job making sure that you never felt alone in that process. And it's been something I've tried to steal and bring to, you know, the teams I'm on now, trying to invite guys over for dinner and text them, you know, when we mm-hmm. get somewhere on the road and things like that. How important was that, you know, for just yeah. your social well-being as a young no, girl? It, it was huge. And honestly, I think, like you just said, I think that's a big reason why now every... This quarantine sucks because, I mean, I can't hang out with anyone. Yeah. Um, and if you do, it's got to be the distance, obviously. And you, know, you kind of just got to sit <laughs> two or three sit meters stare away. At each other, yeah, yeah, sit and stare. Um, and uh, I, I think that's a big reason of why now, like anytime I get the chance of trying to invite people over to, to our condo or our house... Um, trying to have gatherings, I guess you could say, with friends and family constantly just to check in on people. But I think the big thing I learned from him, again, is just making sure everyone's doing well, checking in, make sure everyone's in the right mind and um, feeling good. And I think that's the big thing is just making sure that, uh, you know, uh, I could always be there for someone that anyone needs to ever come over and talk to and, and kind of just, I guess, uh, I don't know how to describe it. Um, I guess to like loosen up a little bit or, or kind of blow some steam that I would be there to mm-hmm. kind of listen and, and, and be able to take it in. And, you know, if they want my advice and I'd be able to give it as well. But uh, I think that's just the big thing. It's just making sure that uh, my house is, is known for always being open to whoever wants to come and whoever wants to talk or, sh- you know, shoot the shit. Yeah. And I guess you're, you, you know, do have this sense of like, so being yourself, it is disarming in a good way. It, you are so comfortable in your own skin. I feel that other people, um, can sense that and it's contagious. And I, I, you know, look forward to your development as a leader, um, with the Leafs. I, I've always been a fan of your game. You know, we've always been close friends and, and I'll always be, uh, rooting for you. Mitchie, thanks for, for coming on today. Um, you know, I had a lot of fun, fun talking. One question mm-hmm. I'll leave you with before the end is, mm-hmm. and just kind of open floor, you know, what is something in the world uh, that's really been lighting you on 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 fire lately. What's something you're really uh, passionate and you're thinking about? What's something that's been heavy on your mind? Uh, it's really could be like JVR talked about the Last Dance and how excited he is to to you know watch uh, you know the story of Jordan things like that. Mm-hmm. I've had uh, you know people talk about you know how grateful they are for frontline workers. Uh, I'll leave it to you, bro. Yeah, no, I mean, I think all of those, uh, the frontline workers, how grateful I think everyone is for them right now. Um, I think, uh, you know, obviously the nurses, doctors are the ones that are are doing a lot for us. But I mean, I think the importance of that is also pointing out the ups delivery people, the Amazon deliveries, um, the delivery guys, girls, um, you know, people that are still working and, and making sure the Wi-Fi is still fully going through this tough time of who knows how many people sitting at home on Wi-Fi constantly daily Mm. doing stuff. Um, The cable, uh, just really anyone out there just, you know, I'd say going into people's houses to kind of risk their own health to try and um, make sure everyone's doing well and and getting what they need. And I I think something that, you know, a guy that I've really kind of been looking up to of recent, uh, I'd say the last year or so is uh, Jimmy Butler on the heat. I just, Mm. You know, someone that is a dog mentality on the on the court. He's the guy that will line up against anyone and kind of stare them in the eye. And that that f you mentality of you know I'm not scared of you. Like let's let's do it. Like whatever you want, I'm here. Like I want to I want the challenge. And I think uh, the crazy thing about that is that he's known as kind of that guy of he's he was known of the guy in Minnesota as kind of a, a bad teammate. And it's surprising to kind of hear that because now you look at all the teams he's been on and hearing all the great things from star players, not just, you know, star players and bench players, I guess you could say really, Mm -hmm. that, you know, talk very highly of him. And then I just saw the other day that he sent basketball nets to every single person on his Miami Heat team so they can continue training on shooting and, you know, working on their game. And that's something that uh, I found really cool. 
And, you know, like I said, it's just that dog mentality he has that, that, that mentality when he gets on that court of just, I ain't afraid of anyone. I'm game I'm on, ready. Man. Yeah. Game I'm, I'm ready to eat. So that's something that I find really cool about him and, um, you know, kind of been looking into more. That's awesome, man. Thanks for sharing it. Um, yeah. how can, how can people find you? How can people donate to your charity? What, uh, where are you at on social media? Yeah. Uh, on social media, I believe it's just, uh, the Marner Assist Fund or Marner Assist Fund. And then on Instagram and Twitter, both of those. And then uh website is MarnerAssistFund.com. And, uh, when you get to the website, everything's going to explain it all. And I believe it's at the bottom of the page. You can still donate. Uh, it ends at 6 p.m. today, but uh, th- for the last thing, for the true packs, but um, for any time donating, I believe you just go to the martyrassistfund.com and there's a donate link at the bottom. Mitchie, thanks for your time, man. I'm uh, so proud of you and your girlfriend, Steph, and and tell Zussi we say hi and, yeah. and uh, I miss you up there. Um, all the best, you know, when hockey, you know, I know I'll talk to you before then, but when mm-hmm. hockey comes back and, and uh, stay with it up there, I love you, man. Thanks for yeah. thanks for coming on, bro. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been awesome. It's been great talking. All right. I'm happy you were able to peel you off the video game. Playing yeah. World of Warcraft or whatever you're doing over there. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get you, hey, we'll get you on it one day, maybe. It's like Robert Pollock, man. It, you know, at least you had got the the charitable function in it. But I, I used to love Polly would give it to like you and Bozy. You know, you guys are grown men. Like, what are you doing playing those bullshit, you know, video games? I, I love Polly for yeah. that. I thought it was oh, outrageous. Yeah. He's but. great. He was great, but um, all right, bro. I'll let you go. Thanks for your time, man. Yes, thank I'll have you. To again, do it man. again. Appreciate it for sure. Okay, talk yep. to you soon, Mitchie. See you, buddy. Wow, what a podcast! Uh, you know, with Mitch Marner, one of my favorite teammates all of all time. One of my favorite players. You know, really to watch night in, night out. He's so real uh, as himself. I've been really proud uh, to see him as a young professional come in. As a young Maple Leaf, there's a lot of pressure playing in that town, uh, and he's he's done it with grace and he's done it with growth. He's really continued to you know become a better player, which is always most important. And I think uh, you know he's done a better job year in year out, managing his energy, dealing with the media, you know, continuing to you know grow bigger, faster, stronger. I thought it was really cool today when he talked about you know his desire to you know be a dog when he was talking about Jimmy Butler and his goal to to win a Selkie. I didn't think. Um, not that he's incapable. I, I think he's certainly got all the tools to do that. But, you know, certainly as a winger, you know, to have that goal of, of winning a Selkie, I think, you know, pretty cool. And talks to, you know, just his, his love and, and his team first mentality to to play a well-rounded game. If you're still listening with us, I did want to do uh, the reverse sponsorship today. I want to talk about a couple. This is not an ad. These are not sponsored. I want to talk about a couple favorite brands and, and restaurants that are still doing an awesome job as we record this on quarantine. I'm still shouting out Dirty Root and West Loop Chicago. They're doing an outstanding job. Their special this week as I record this is a paleo lasagna, which you will probably see on my Instagram feed later this week because it looks dynamite. Uh, I also wanted to support, you know, Mitchie and I talked about our love for coffee. Thanks to John Jeller and uh, Paul Ayot, the trainers in, uh, with the Leafs. Uh, support Pilot Coffee Roasters, Propeller Coffee Roasters, two awesome uh, shops out in Toronto. You know, there's nothing wrong with uh, your your bigger corporations and, th- and things like that, but it's a good time to vote with your dollar, you know, for our small businesses. Um, I'm a big fan of Dark Matter here in Chicago. Wanted to give them uh, some love. And then City of Saints out in Jersey, if you're out in, in Hoboken, was where I a lot of times I would get my beans from there. Thank you again to all of our listeners. Please continue to like, subscribe, uh, share with your loved ones. So if you're still with us, thank you from wherever you are in the world. Uh, and thank you to Mitch for your time today. Uh, truly enjoyed ch- talking to you. You know, I learned something about you uh, every time we do. Um, that was the Connor Carrick Podcast. And thanks for staying with us today. We'll see you next week. <laughs>